Thank you, Mr. Boswell. A little who's on first there, right? Okay, well, happy Sabbath to everyone. Such a beautiful day outside. Wonderful to be here. And greetings to all our guests. <clears throat> well, brethren, the death of Jesus Christ is the most well-known death in all of history. There's probably only very few people living today who are not aware of the death of Jesus Christ. It's, it is a well-known historical fact. While most <clears throat> many may not believe it, but they've at least heard of Jesus Christ, heard of his, his death. So most in our world do know that Jesus Christ died some 2,000 years ago. He was innocent and yet he was placed on trial and sentenced to death. He was crucified, which was a punishment that was reserved for the worst of offenders. Brethren, at Passover time, we often review the life and the death and suffering of Jesus Christ and its meaning for us. In this message, I'd like to ask a question. The question is, who's responsible for Christ's death? Who bears the responsibility? Were the Jews responsible? Were the Romans responsible? Was anyone else responsible for the death of Jesus Christ? That's the topic we're going to look at today as we approach the Passover season. So let's start by asking, looking into the Jews. For some 2,000 years now, the Jews have largely been blamed for the death of Jesus Christ. They've been persecuted, they've been attacked, they've been hated by many people throughout, uh, throughout the Middle Ages, all the way down even to our modern era. And many have blamed the Jews exclusively for the killing of Jesus Christ. And they use this as a perverted excuse to attack them. Let's take a look at what the Jews' role and responsibility was in Christ's death. If you'll open your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. <clears throat> Mark chapter 14, we'll read verses 60 through 65. This is just after Jesus was arrested and he was brought before the chief priests and he was being falsely accused there. And they accused him of blasphemy. <clears throat> and we'll pick it up in verse 60. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Remember, Jesus Christ, he was telling them, I am. He was referring back to the Old Testament. I am that I am. He was identifying himself with that same being. Verse 63, Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. And then some of them began to spit on him and blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, Prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palm of their hands. So here we see the leaders of the Jews, the chief priests, the scribes were gathered together, and they all thought that he was <clears throat> worthy to be condemned to death. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, we'll start in verse 20. Um, <clears throat> this, so the Jews wanted to condemn him to death. They were not allowed to actually kill him. They weren't allowed to take out, uh, to carry out that death sentence. And so they took him before Pilate, the Roman governor, because he would have had the authority to do that. <clears throat> and Pilate asked them to choose between, you know, releasing Barabbas or Jesus. And the crowd, of course, chose, uh, they wanted Barabbas released to them and they wanted Jesus to be crucified. Well, let's read verse uh, 20. Again, we see here the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes. So it started with the leaders, and they spread this attitude of wanting to, to have Jesus killed. 
they persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for, for, for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, uh, which of the two of you do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with this Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. I'd like to drop down to verse 25. And the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. And then they released Barabbas to them. And when they had scourged Jesus, they delivered him to be crucified. So the leaders of the Jews then persuaded this whole crowd to call for the, the death of Jesus Christ for his crucifixion. They willingly took blame for the killing of Jesus. So we see the high priests influenced this great multitude to call for Jesus' death. So were they responsible? Certainly they were in their, in their own way. What about anybody else? What about Pilate? They took him before Pilate. What about the, Roman, the Romans in general? So that's our next group of people we'll look at. Matthew chapter 27. I skipped verse 24. I'd like to go back and read it. <clears throat> uh, Matthew 27, verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult, tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. So Pilate was willing to sentence Jesus to the punishment of crucifixion, knowing that he was innocent. Pilate was afraid of the Jews starting up a big rebellion and disturbing the peace in his, his area of rulership. He didn't want to have a, a problem going on. Jews also later on accused Pilate basically of not being loyal to Caesar, saying, well, if you're going to let this man who claims to be a king, then you're not loyal to Caesar. So Pilate had his own self-interest involved, and he did condemn Jesus to be crucified. <clears throat> what about the Roman soldiers that scourged him and crucified him? Certainly they bear responsibility for the death of Jesus Christ. If you'll turn to John chapter 19, we'll read about one such soldier. John chapter 19, verse 34. This is near the very end of Christ's life. He was still alive at this point. <clears throat> and we'll read about a Roman soldier in verse 34. Uh, let's see. John 19. I'm in the wrong book here. Let's go to John 19. And uh, verse 34. <clears throat> and then one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. So he was, a Roman soldier took a spear at one point and jammed it right up in his, in his body. And we hear the blood and all that poured out of his body. We understand that Christ was still alive at this point. He was not dead yet. And that soldier certainly who pierced his side would have been responsible, as would have been the others that carried out the brutal torture and killing of our Lord and Savior. So is there anyone else who's responsible? As we're asking this question today, let's turn to Acts chapter 4. If you'll turn over to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, this is just after Peter and John had been preaching in Christ's name, and they <clears throat> were stopped and scolded by the Sanhedrin. They were warned and threatened that if they continued this, they'd be in big trouble. And they got together with uh, the other followers of Jesus Christ and encouraged one another. And in verse 27, uh, they were saying, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever, uh, whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. He was, um, here Peter was saying, not just the Jews and the Romans were implicated in all that had transpired in the death of Jesus Christ, but also all of Israel and Gentiles as well. No doubt there was some in that multitude. So this is leaving very few people left, isn't it? Is anyone else responsible for the death of Jesus Christ? 
Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 3. In the book of Genesis chapter 3, this is after Satan had tempted Adam and Eve and they sinned. And the Lord uh, pronounced his cursings upon Satan, upon mankind. <clears throat> and uh, verse 15 I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you, speaking of Satan, shall bruise his heel, referring to Jesus Christ. This refers, this is a prophecy that Satan would bruise Jesus' heel. It refers to, uh, to Christ's crucifixion and death. So we have Satan being responsible. Is there anyone else who could be responsible Turn with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Let's read verse uh, 21, starting in 21 through 27. John chapter 13. This was on the Passover before uh, Christ died that night. <clears throat> as he was gathered with his disciples to keep the Passover. John 13 verse 21. And when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. You know, this was John. Simon Peter, therefore, motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. And then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. We know that Simon went out and betrayed Jesus and led, uh, led the soldiers to arrest him and betrayed him with a kiss. So Judas was responsible. Of course, we read here, too, that Judas had been influenced by Satan to do what he did. Satan also influenced the Jews who called for his crucifixion. He influenced the Romans that carried it out. And Satan has been influencing all of mankind from Adam, Adam and Eve all the way down to me and to you. Is there anyone else responsible? I think you all know where this message has been leading. If you'll turn to Isaiah chapter 53. We consider the death of our Lord and Savior. Let's read Isaiah chapter 53. Verses 4 through 6. <clears throat> says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Verse 6, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The iniquity of us all. My sins, your sins, were laid on Jesus Christ. So we each bear responsibility for the death of Jesus Christ. Yes, it's true. Jesus, uh, excuse me, Judas betrayed Ju Jesus to the Jews. Yes. The Jews plotted to kill Jesus. They wanted him crucified. Yes, they stirred up the Gentiles and the Israelites, and all those consented also to his death. And yes, the Romans carried it out. And yes, Satan influenced them to do it. But each of us bears a responsibility as well. I think we all know that. That's why we come to the Passover soberly reflecting on the death of Jesus Christ, his awesome sacrifice for us, I'd like to read Romans chapter 3, verse 23. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short 
of the glory of God. That doesn't leave out anyone. All is inclusive of just of every human being. <clears throat> so everyone who's ever lived because of their sin is, bears responsibility for Jesus' death. And that is why we will gather together to memorialize Christ's Passover sacrifice. This is why we examine ourselves and come before him in a right attitude. We don't want to take his sacrifice lightly or treat it as a common thing or to not recognize the sin that required that sacrifice. But I have a, a, one more question. Was there anyone else who was responsible for Jesus' death? Brethren, the Father and Jesus Christ are also responsible, although not in the same way as you and me. You see, they did not sin, yet they did consent to Jesus Christ's death for all of mankind. But they consented out of righteousness and a desire to save each and every one of us. Let's keep reading in Romans where we're at, picking up in verse 24. <clears throat> Well, I'll start back in verse 23 again. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So everybody needs something to save them. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation, means like an atonement for sin, by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I'd like to turn back to Isaiah chapter 53. Christ died for us willingly to pay that price so that he could pass over our sins and cover our sins with his blood. Let's read Isaiah chapter 53. We read a passage of this earlier. I'd like to read verses 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's that bruising, talking about the, the death of Jesus Christ. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. It pleased God to allow Christ to go through the humiliation, the suffering, and the death that he did for everyone who's ever lived. Everyone we just talked about is blessed because of that willing sacrifice. So that's how it could be pleasing to the Lord to allow that to go happen, to allow that unjust death to be carried out. Uh, you all know John 3, verse 16 and 17. I will read that. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, a memory verse we all know well. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but, but that the world through him might be saved. They had a plan to save this world, to save you and me. Now turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. I'd like to read that as well. Romans chapter 8, I'd like to read uh, beginning in verse 31. Verse 31 of Romans 8 says, What shall we say to these things? For if God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son... But delivered him, but delivered him up for us all. He willingly gave up his son. The father allowed this to happen. They decided that this was how it was going to be. The Christ, Christ as the word, decided I'm going to be the one to do it. 
They did it willingly. Uh, continuing on, how shall you not also give us, uh, give also freely, give us all things? Christ wants to give us all things. He has a plan to give us life and a hope and a future and to bless us tremendously. Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is he who condemns. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also writ risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Christ is at the right hand of the Father interceding for you, for me. He's on our side. He is so in support of us. When we stumble and when we mess up and when we go to him to repent, he's quick to forgive. He wants that relationship. He's there rooting us on. <clears throat> so, brethren, we've seen it wasn't just the Jews or the Romans who were responsible. All of mankind is guilty of sin and thus responsible for the death of Christ. I'm responsible. You are responsible. And Christ willingly offered himself to take the death penalty for our sins. With this in mind, let's prepare to gather together, soberly participate in the Passover service, Let's recognize the profound significance of what Christ our Savior did for us. Let's recognize our personal, personal relationship with Jesus Christ and God the Father. Brethren, we have so much to be thankful for. I hope you all have a very meaningful, inspiring Passover and Spring Holy Days.